Hello and welcome back to another episode of my Factorial 1.0 tutorial Let's Play. I'm Exterminator and thank you for joining me again. Uh, today we are going to be covering some pretty hefty topics. Uh, we're going to cover uh, blueprints, at least the basics of blueprints, uh, and importing blueprints and rails because the blueprints we're going to be using right now and importing are rail blueprints. So last episode I asked you for your feedback and thoughts in regards to uh, you know, if you feel okay with me importing my own uh, rail blueprints instead of making them all on camera as long as I explain them and still go over the concepts of rails and blueprints respectively. So uh, you guys seemed okay with that. You you all pretty much seemed to agree that, that was a good idea. And I'm really happy because uh, it would have been very tedious to do that uh, on camera. So uh, one, la one, one thing here I do want to mention before we get into that though, uh, I did get uh, a comment last episode that uh, <laughs> I was driving someone crazy because apparently they had made several comments on previous videos uh, that I, I didn't see or maybe I didn't I just forgot to fix it uh, in regards to my electric engine build that there was an inserter uh, turned the wrong way or sorry there was an inserter missing rather on the third assembler um, outputting uh, I did I do want to mention I, I did fix that so I'm, I apologize that I didn't do it sooner I think I like somehow didn't see your comment or just forgot I have a very short uh, memory span unfortunately but I did fix that um, so let's talk blueprints because of course we need to import the blueprint uh, before we uh, we need to import the blueprint here before we actually uh, can, can do anything with it so uh, first things first is importing blueprints. Now, blueprints use a uh, they use a string, a very long uh, it's it's called a blueprint string, um, a very long string of numbers, letters that is what is used to basically identify the blueprint. Okay, and this is how you will import blueprints. Now, uh, you can if you if you have blueprints already within a game, you can go into your blueprint library default B. Um, and you can put them in my blueprints and these will um, persist throughout your save games uh, as long as you're on the same version and stuff uh, of, of the game uh, in the same install as some people may have multiple installs of the game uh, so if, if like in their own zip files so if you do that then they won't necessarily persist but if you're playing through steam and stuff they will so these these are all uh, you know from my uh, you know my blueprints I've used throughout several games now the blueprint book we're actually going to use is this one um, And th this is actually in here so I can import it by just clicking this and bringing it in um, However, I'm going to show you the actual blueprint string import because this is how you will get blueprints from outside of your game so if you find them online or in other people's videos or What have you? Um, this is how you will do it. So down here. There is a blueprint import string button now if you don't have this um, I think there should be a way to I thought there was a way to do this in the blueprint library there used to be um, and, and, and there seems to not be any more um, so I think there may be a hotkey for this though uh, so you could probably do it this way or if you go to make a blueprint I believe there's a button uh, in here so I don't I, I don't the, it, it, this is all new to me so uh, export string okay it looks like you do have to actually do it um, through this right here uh, and you do have this thing to show import strings you want that checked uh, let's go ahead and just delete this one and this one this blank one that we've done here uh, just get rid of it somewhere um, well we'll use that eventually so uh, import string we click this button and this is where we import the string now I copied the string already and if I paste this in this is what it looks like it's a very very long string in this case because it's a blueprint book with multiple blueprints in it um, and blueprint books do have strings just like blueprints and I'll show you how to access those here shortly and I click import and this is now imported it it's in my cursor I can place it here and it's in uh, now how to actually access blueprint strings if we right click on this um, there's several different buttons but there's one right here that says export to string and this is going to generate the string that I basically just had and used to import it and this is this is the case on all blueprints all blueprint books you can do this on a per blueprint level if you'd like to uh, so there you go uh, again in this case it was already in here but I wanted to show you so that's how you import strings from outside of your um, outside of your your game uh, and once you unlock I think it should be like construction robots um, whatever allows you to start doing blueprints or I think blueprints are actually unlocked from the beginning so you really should have access to this um, now 
Once we do that, we have a blueprint. And blueprints uh, are basically ghost prints, but they are pre uh, predefined, I, I suppose would be a good way to put it. So they don't work any differently than ghost prints that we've already used here. Uh, the difference being is is that they're already a, a predefined setup of it. So ghost prints, you know, we, we, in these particular, we either shift left clicked these down to create ghosts or we created the copy paste tool. Uh, and the blueprints are basically just like permanent copies of things. So uh, we have a book here. You can have blueprint books or you can just have singular blueprints. Blueprint books are great for things like rails, for example, where you have multiple different rail orientations or setups you want, um, and you don't want to have, you know, in this case, five different blueprints in your inventory, you can put them all in one book. And it's pretty straightforward, you can just click here, get a blueprint book, we can create a blueprint, create blueprint, and I can just right click a book, and you just drop it in, boom, done. And you can put more in here. And in fact, you can actually do recursive blueprint books where you can actually put a book inside of a book um, and then do that. So we'll go into that later. We don't really need that feature right now. Um, so that's there. Okay, now I'm gonna make some furnaces so this will stop beeping at me. Um, so we now have this blueprint book and to use these, uh, you, just, you just click on it and we'll pull up whatever one is defaulted to. Now in a blueprint book, since there are multiple blueprints within it, uh, to scroll through the blueprints, you hold shift and mouse wheel either up or down. And it will go, well, wh whichever direction. If you mouse wheel down, it will go down from the current one. Or if you mouse wheel up, it'll go up from the current one uh, in the order the blueprint is. So if I go down, it's going to go to the two lane T junction 90 degrees, which is this. Okay. Uh, now, with singular blueprints, this obviously is not really a feature uh, because it's just it's just one blueprint that there's nothing else to scroll through um, so that's how you access these and then you can just scroll through these if you have multiple books within each other it will s scroll through this uh, we'll go into that more in depth once we get there once we have books inside of books inside of books that's a very new thing that's a 1.0 feature um, so it's, it's really quite new we now have this blueprint again works exactly the same of these I place it just the same if I hold shift it will um, mark for deconstruction anything that might be in the way if I let go of shift, it will tell me what is in the way. And uh, if I don't hold shift, uh, you know, and try to place it, it'll, it'll leave those spaces missing in the blueprint where there are things in the way. So uh, these rails, uh, these rail blueprints are ones I've used for quite a long time. Uh, disclaimer, they are not absolutely perfect. Uh, I consider them to be very usable and very much um, sufficient for everything I need. I've used them in a uh, about four to 5,000 science per minute base, which uh, nowadays is not huge. Back in the day, it was one of the biggest bases um, that I made. Uh, it, well, one of the biggest bases uh, in the community, uh, a base which I made, and um, it was sufficient for that. The, these real blueprints worked for that, uh, and, and, and I'm very confident they will work for this. So you are welcome to uh, use these. Uh, you, if you, they're actually on my website along with quite a few other blueprints that I have used in the past. Uh, my website is linked in the description of, I believe, all my videos. Um, it is extermvideos.com. And uh, there, if at the top, there will be a Factorio logo uh, in, on the website, like in the navigation bar, there will be a Factorio logo. And then if you mouse over or click on that, there's a section for blueprints. And you can just grab the strings for all the blueprints. And this one is on there. Uh, so we take this. And the difference uh, between this and the rail we've built uh, is the rail we've built is obviously just one lane. And this has the fairly obvious problem of not really allowing multiple trains to be on here at once without bypasses, as I've mentioned previously. Because uh, obviously they will collide unless you have bypasses, and that's not great. Uh, you, you know, it's like it's basically like having a, a one lane road. And then, you know, if someone decides to drive the, uh, the wrong way on the one way road, it, it doesn't really work. Um, so uh, this is why we have this system, because this is like just a normal road um, where there's a lane going each direction. Now, something very important to note here is this setup, these blueprints are oriented for right hand drive, uh, like how we drive in America and other countries in the world. Uh, you know, I know in Europe, a lot of several, I don't know if everywhere in Europe, I apologize for not having perfect knowledge on that, but quite a few places in Europe, I know for sure, obviously use left-hand drive system. Uh, like I said in a previous video, I think there are pros and cons to each. Uh, I set it up right-hand drive just because that's what I'm used to. I live in America and 
it's very just it's much easier for my brain to work and build rails in the orientation that I am used to driving every single day. Um, even though it's a car, not a train, uh, th this is what I'm used to. So that's what these blueprints are for. If you're used to left-hand drive, um, there are many, many fantastic blueprint books out there. I believe Neil Laos probably has a blueprint book, and I'm guessing his is left-hand drive. It may not be. Uh, Colonel Will has some. If you can probably just search them. Uh, this can be converted fairly easily to left-hand drive by just swapping the signals. Um, the junctions is where it becomes a little more difficult, but you can just easily reorient this blueprint I'm using to left-hand drive. So we have this. There's a rail each direction, uh, and what I've done is I've put power poles down the middle, and I've also put, you'll see at the top there, there's a signal on the right-hand side, and then down here, there's a signal on the left-hand side on that other rail. And the way these are placed is this allows them to be um, repeatable and stampable. Uh, so if I if I place one and then go to place another one and overlap the power poles, um, it will it'll work perfectly. The signals will line up, the power poles will line up, the rails will connect, and that's that's what we aim for in these. So we can just easily stamp them without having to, uh, you know, like fiddle around with exactly placement or like fill in rails, um, as they all work together. So let me show you that in practice. Uh, we have this rail. And I'm actually going to tear this up. And this is going to temporarily, at least, uh, render this train unable to go anywhere. Uh, and, and it's going to also cut power to the outpost, which is fine. Uh, you know, the, the, we'll, we'll hook this all back up properly. I'm also going to, I think I am going to go here and research another robot speed. This is, these robots are a little bit slow for my liking. Um, so a deconstruction planner, I think we've used this before, but if we haven't, uh, you can use Alt D to bring it up or click on this, or you can access it. Um, well, if you have one in here, you can access it. So this one is already predefined um, for Rails, and we'll get into that in a minute. So you can take this and you just click, hold click and drag, and it will mark anything that it encompasses for deconstruction, unless it's filtered. Now to filter it, just like anything else, um, I'm gonna actually put one in my inventory. Uh, you can right click this just like a blueprint and you can go in here and set filters now whitelist means it's only going to Deconstruct the things you set blacklist is exactly the opposite. It will deconstruct everything except the filters you set So the one set for rails I have whitelisted Which means it will only deconstruct rails even if I select my entire base it'll only select rails and signals and uh, large power poles in this case um, to be deconstructed if I set blacklist, it will do the opposite and say that everything except these can be deconstructed. And this works. Um, you, you can do any any item in the game, much like setting logistic filters and circuit network filters. You can set everything in here. There's also unsorted. There's some special things here like tile ghosts, entity ghosts. So you can deconstruct only ghosts. Items on ground, which is very nice. Uh, item request slots, which is pretty interesting. This is... Uh, to indicate a request for construction boss to deliver an item. Uh, so this re re deletes the item request. I actually didn't know about that one. Uh, there's also tiles. So you can select specific tiles uh, like concrete and such landfill. Um, I don't know why you would, can you actually delete landfill? Probably ghost landfill. That's actually a very interesting thing. I don't, I didn't think you could erase landfill. Um, <laughs> uh, we're actually gonna try this. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested, I, I don't, think you can get rid of landfill but we're gonna we're gonna try yeah so uh, this is probably for ghost landfill like if you ghost it down because robots can build it um, but you can't pick it back up uh, so that's a deconstruction planner I've deconstructed this let's clear that filter you just right click it and we're gonna pull this up I'm um, gonna pull up quite a bit of this and it is a little bit of a tedious process um, although I don't think we have to do all of it we may be able to just stop up here depending how things line up for us and hopefully this robot research finishes. We've got an achievement here for deconstructing 100 objects. Uh, and then we're going to start placing these rails. Now, uh, our station is here. Unfortunately, this lake is a fair bit in the way. Um, however, I think we are safe probably for doing this. Although I am tempted to actually put this on the other side of the lake. That does make things a fair bit troublesome, uh, to say the least. If I do this here, it would leave room for 
a stacker, which is a whole nother training thing we'll go into. I'm just trying to think out loud here. Um, and this is part of Rails. This is something that, uh, you know, you may change your mind on on the fly. Uh, I had planned it out to go here, but then now that I'm looking at it, uh, I do think that perhaps a stacker here, we can later landfill this lake. I think this may actually be a good idea. For now, we can just makeshift um, a, a path to this station. We don't have to worry about building the stack at this moment just because we'll be f far too much to cover in this episode. Uh, however, uh, I think I have decided I'm going to place the main line, is what we would call it here, the main line on the other side of this lake. So we're going to take our blueprint. Um, it is the one we want defaulted to. This is my straight rail. And uh, you can make smaller versions if you want. You can make longer versions. This seemed like a good version to me, and it was uh, tileable. So we're going to place this, uh, let's say, here. And I'm going to hold shift. Now, I suppose something we should cover. I haven't set these blueprints up for this yet because it's a brand new feature. Um, but if you go into a blueprint, right click. Uh, this is a new thing in 1.0 where you can set grids and absolute reference points to the global grid, um, which allows for easier tiling and stamping down through the map view because you can't place blueprints through the map view. Uh, and then uh, it will align it to a global grid. Uh, now, uh, ideally, I would do this, and perhaps for maybe later in the series, we can set up some blueprints just to show that feature off. Um, how are this redesigning these rails, th these rail blueprints to work with that, um, especially on the turning the curve rails and the um, horizontal, the, the diagonal ones and the junctions is fair, quite a bit difficult. I worked on it for a fair bit on stream, and uh, this one is very simple. The rest are quite a bit of a pain. Um, we could do this one. Uh, I suppose let's do this one. Uh, so if we select grid size, and then we also select absolute reference point. Um, so there's a few things we need to change on here. And, and I know this may seem complicated. It is a brand new feature. I'm not entirely used to it, but it will make more sense once I do it and show you what this is doing. Um, so we do this. Uh, what we need to do is we need to reduce this in um, to make this... Uh, I think I actually need to go 56, or maybe it's 54. Um, so I'm reducing just on the X axis here I'm reducing the size and we need to move this so I'm just um, holding shift and dragging and that should put this where it needs to go um, so I centered it on these power poles and then I'm going to save this blueprint and it will save within here okay so here's what this does uh, if I take this you can see it's snapping it is automatically snapping to a certain point um, it's not as freely dragging as it was before right um, and this is snapping to the global grid. Uh, now for the straight rail, I did do this because one, it's easy. And number two, uh, starting with the global grid is nice. This will, this will make things easier if we do eventually transition to having our other blueprints be on the global grid. Um, so this is why I wanted to, at the very minimum, do this one. And this also works in the map, as you can see. Um, this is not me precisely doing this. It is snapping to these specific points. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and place this here. And I'm going to hold shift just in case there's anything that needs deconstructing. And the robots will now place it down. Now, if I did this correctly, um, this the next snapping point should overlap correctly with this, um, as I would intend it to if I were to place this uh, manually without the snapping. And we're about to find out. So it's placed this. Um, another thing I suppose to mention is I do have the circuit wires, the red and green circuit wire wires, which we have touched on. We have used briefly. Um, I believe we've only used red wires. Green wires work exactly the same. They just transmit another signal along with the red wires just so you can have two different signals going down here. Um, I have these running across the whole thing just because in the off chance that I do want to do some sort of circuit condition that is tied to my outposts um, or some far off production base, this is already set up to do so. This is absolutely not necessary. This doesn't add any functionality to the trains themselves. Um, that is required, I should say. Um, this is quite useful if you do plan to do some circuit network condition um, on a s delivery station based on an outpost condition, which gets f a lot more complicated than we need to go into right now. But that's why these are here. Um, the trains will run perfectly fine without them. 
uh, but, but they're here, just in case. They don't hurt anything. Um, so if we now take this, the next snapping point does in fact work perfectly. So you can see it is automatically snapping here. It is overlapping the power pole. If I had not reduced in that, that um, grid, that green outline, we would actually end up with two power poles. Um, just because it would have it would have extended the rail too much past it, we wouldn't have ended up with uh, duplicate power poles right next to each other. So that's why I reduced this one. And if we just click this again. Uh, no, you know I could hit Shift. Actually, I should have just in case there was anything to be deconstructed. And it'll go ahead. They'll go ahead and place this. And then we can go again. Now, of course, we are going to hit this. So this is the point where I would now switch to. And again, I'm scroll wheeling through. Switch to this. Uh, now, setting this to a global grid is a fair bit more difficult. I think um, we can try it. It's a bit fiddly. Maybe we'll get lucky. Um, so we go here. Same deal. Uh, and I think I need to reduce this, if it's the same thing, to 30. And then I'm going to hold shift, and I'm going to drag this. And it looks like... Okay, yeah. So, so this is finicky because rails work on, like... The rails themselves are on a grid system rails are, are like it's hard to explain rails are two tiles wide and they will only move on two tile increments so you can't move a rail by one tile you have to move it by a rails width which is two tiles so i can't it won't actually let me reduce this to 20 i mean it will let me do it to 29 um but now it won't let me move it is the problem i'm holding shift i'm trying to click and move this and it won't it won't let me do it um if i go to 28 it'll let me do it but this is Oh, this is actually maybe the correct size now. Hmm. Okay, maybe this works. Maybe we got lucky. Although it doesn't, I don't think it includes this signal. Um, which I suppose isn't the worst problem to have. Um, but I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is not going to work. But we'll find out. <laughs> this is some trial and error for us here, guys. So this does work, actually. Um, this is brilliant. This is actually fantastic. Um, this worked far better than I thought. Although, um... Oh, is that actually including that? What do you know? Anyway, this is actually working better than I thought. We did run out of rail uh, signals, which I did actually set up to make in our hub before I started this video. Um, so that's actually easier than I thought. Okay, so that is how that works. Now, um, also another thing to note, and this is a lot. I know this is a lot, guys. I'm sorry. I I'm trying to touch on things as we go. I don't want to leave anything out. Um, so much like other parts of this series, I will be covering each of these things again and again as we go over them again and again um, So to refresh your memory, uh, but if you have questions do leave them below um, now I've left three rail spaces in between here. This is a personal choice. You can certainly leave just two This is also fairly common um, at least with the right hand drive system. I found leaving three spaces does make this um, much easier to signal on junctions. Uh, if I left two spaces, I did have a fair bit of a problem signaling things properly and fully on my junction. So this is why I left a three spacing here. Uh, this is optional. It doesn't really hurt anything except take up more room. Um, it helps with signaling for me personally. Uh, two is certainly sufficient. Uh, and one is not, I would not suggest one. It makes things very difficult. You won't actually be able to signal your junctions properly. It'll look pretty wonky, in my opinion. Um, you could go even bigger, I suppose, if you want. Again, that starts to get a little bit ridiculous, but it is your choice. I would say two or three is a very, very viable option. Um, now, we've made this turn. Okay, so we've made this turn, and we now need to uh, work with our diagonal rail. Get rid of that bug and you can kind of see where this is going so these are going to be much better rail systems because we have a one lane going one direction another lane going the opposite direction and we can easily split off of here and go into wherever we need to and we can do that either with a full junction um, which i have here or we can do it with just a simple little one rail pull off which we'll do and i haven't even touched on signals yet uh, that's because on a straight rail um it's not as easy to explain them as on a junction, which we will go into. So that's why I haven't actually showed them yet, or discussed them, rather. Uh, signals are um, not intuitive, in my opinion. And I, I think there's a lot of people who agree with me. Signals are not intuitive in Factorio. And I will do my absolute best to explain them. I do want to 
give a dis disclaimer though that um, I am not a rail signal expert. I can signal junctions, I would say sufficiently, uh, decently even, uh, and straight rail signals are really pretty straightforward. Um, explaining the rail uh, signals, uh, I find it a little difficult. I, I will try my best. Um, just finding the, the correct words and explanation to actually, uh, you know, bring to you an under uh, an understandable um, you know reasoning behind what they do is is a little difficult for me but I will try my best so I suppose to maybe close out here um, rail signals create now now we do use rail signals in real life so that does help um, but rail signals create blocks essentially and this is very visible when you actually take a rail signal um, so, so this does help. The devs have improved on this over the years. Um, if you take a rail signal, you can see we have, uh, well, we have two things. We have these little green markers, much like we do with offshore pumps, and this shows you everywhere a rail signal can be placed, which is quite helpful. And it shows you, um, it's, you'll notice it's only showing it on one side of the track, and this is because it continues the um, pattern of where you've already placed a rail signal. So there's already only signals on this side, so it's only showing me the green ones on, on one side, on the side the rail signals are already on. Uh, now, you can place them on both sides. There is a white square here, and if you do this, it'll now show it on both sides. This, of course, will have just ruined my setup, um, but uh, that's how, you know, if it's not displaying, you, you just need to place one there, and it, you need to place it across. So that's where you would start. You need to place it across from one that already exists where this white square is. Uh, now, the rail signal blocks are indicated by colors. You can see here we have uh, a teal-ish one, and then we have a pink one here, and then we have a yellow one. And you'll notice that they span exactly between where two rails are, and this is a block. So the section from one signal to another signal is considered a block. And uh, how this works is that any train in this and only trains. If you like, go park a tank on this, it will not trigger the signals, so you will die <laughs> if you're in there. Uh, maybe not in a tank, but you get the point. It's only trains and train entities. Um, anything in here, is, any train entity in here is going to signal to this signal, tell the signal that, hey, there is something you know, in this block ahead of you. You need to turn red. And that's exactly what it will do. Um, so if we take, say, a locomotive, for example, it can be a wagon, it can be any, any train entity, any of these three things, and we place this in here, you'll notice the signal is now red, because it's saying, hey, there's something in this block between this signal and this signal, so you need to turn red, because if you don't, there's going to be a crash. And the same would hold true for this block in here. If you had something in each, both signals would be red. Uh, and if you had something just in this block, then this one will remain green because obviously if there's nothing in here, it'll allow it to go and it will stop it at this signal. And that's how signals work. And that's why it's very straightforward on straight rails and even these rails uh, because it's pretty intuitive, pretty logical to me, I would say, um, you know. So that's how that works. Um, in junctions, it gets a fair bit more complicated and I will do my best to explain it. We'll get to junctions here probably next episode. Um, but this is, so, so this is what, what we work with on straight rails. And uh, it will color code them. So once I add another section here, it'll be a different color, etc. cetera. And uh, the colors are not necessarily uh, like representative of something specific, like teal doesn't specifically represent something special and yellow doesn't represent something special. It's just, separate colors to separate different rail blocks. Um, so if you do this, you know, it doesn't change it. Uh, but this, you know, so anything in here, it's going to turn this signal red. Uh, now there is a second type of signal. There are chain rail chain signals. And these work uh, a bit differently. They're actually very, very neat. Uh, and, and they're very, very useful in junctions. They are pretty much your bread and butter for junctions. So we look here, this says, defines a rail system into blocks allowing multiple trains to run on the same network. Not very descriptive. Uh, this one says, reads the next signals in the path to allow better control of trains. Somewhat descriptive, but not really. Uh, so if we take these, 
Uh, much like power poles and other things, you can quickly replace them on top of signals. Um, but what this does is these chain signals are actually fantastic. Um, so, for example, we're going to just place another signal here, just so I don't have to walk as far up. We'll get rid of this once we're done with this. Um, chain signals look past the block directly in front of them to see if there's a train, and they will signal um, accordingly. So, again, if we have a train here, it's going to turn this signal red, but this one's still green because there's nothing in here. And for straight rails, that's perfectly fine, right? There's really no problem with that. But for junctions, this can create an issue because you can end up, for example, let's say that this train is here, hypothetically in an imaginary junction, and this is also part of the junction. And let's just say there's a, another cross right here for a junction, right? Let's just say we have a, another rail going this way. Well, what's going to happen now is if there's a train, and the train is, say, like three wagons long, uh, even though there's a train here that would stop, you, you know, that, that stops this train from actually proceeding through this junction, this hypothetical junction, um, secondary train is only going to stop at this signal, and if he's three cargo wagons long, he's going to block this cross path and allow, and stop, sorry, all other traffic from proceeding through this junction. Uh, you know, which is not ideal. Yeah, ideally, we would want him to stop back here before he even enters the junction, right? If he can't fully pass through the junction, we want him to stop before he even enters the junction. Makes sense. Uh, and this is where chain signals come into play. So we place a chain signal here. You'll notice this chain signal is now red, which is stopping it before it enters the junction, which is precisely what we want. And this is because it's looking more than just the block ahead of it. It's it's looking in here, of course, but then it's also looking the next rail block ahead of it and it's saying, well, hey, there's a train, you know, not directly in front of me, but one ahead of that. So I need to, st I need to turn red at this point. Okay. Uh, now, if we were to pick this up, it would turn yellow, it would turn green. And if we place this train out here, uh, this is now green again, and the reason for this is because there's another signal separating it. So it will only look one normal signal ahead of itself. Uh, if we place a chain signal here, they both turn red because it's now... Th this one is looking ahead just like a chain signal does, right? It's looking here and here, and it's red. And then this chain signal is seeing a red signal in front of it, and it's turning red. So you can, as the name would indicate, chain these together, and it, you know, chain looks ahead. Uh, so having these before crosses is very, very helpful. Again, I will show you this in a proper junction. We have a full junction where this will be much better indicated, um, but that's how chain signals work. Now, one last thing they do, and I think this is a good place to close out the episode. One last thing they do is they have a third state. Rather than just green and red, they have yellow or, or orange, whichever color you want to call it. And this is, this is where uh, another thing where they're really, really cool. Um, so if we have, let's, let's replace this, right? Let's, let's set this back here. Guys, attack me while I'm explaining. It's a bit rude. Um, so we already saw what this does, right? He's red. However, if we say had a split off here, It goes here. Um, you can see this is now blue. I'm sorry. It's it's blue. I don't know why I had yellow or orange in my head. Ignore that color statement initially. I don't know why I thought that. It's blue. So it has green, which is obvious. Red, which is obvious. And then it has blue. I really don't know why I said yellow or orange. It's blue. Um, in this third state, it's saying, hey, the path directly in front of me is blocked. But there is a secondary route around this this uh, you know blocking section, this blockage, that you can take, and it will let a train through here if the train's destination um, includes going down this rail. Okay, so if we had a train going down here to say this outpost where it is eventually going to connect to, um, this chain signal will actually let the train through and tell it to go this way, 
And this is where it's really cool because, you know, it, instead of a normal signal, which just won't do that, a normal signal just won't. Um, well, it'll, well, it'll be green and then it will probably just have the train go here. Um, the train could go here depending on how the train wants to path. Usually trains try to make the shortest path. But again, you could have different outcomes, which is another issue with the normal signals in this case. Um, but having a chain signal, um, it won't let it, you know, it won't, it won't have it come park here. It'll actually have it go the free route, um, which is really, really nice. So that's the third state, the third um, ability of chain signals is it will let you take a different route. And, and this is uh, not necessarily as useful in junctions. It can be in some junctions, excuse me, but uh, this can be really nice in other situations, which we'll get into. But there's chain signals, okay? And th this will hopefully be much more apparent and make more sense um, once we actually build a proper junction and you can see these things in play. And uh, there's a nice little rule um, that uh, one of the one of my Factorio, uh, longtime Factorio friends taught me a very long time ago when I was struggling with Rails. Um, there's a nice little rule that, uh, that they taught me that uh, really helps me remember how to signal junctions properly. And I'm gonna go over that with you when we do junctions. And it, it makes things a lot simpler in my opinion. Um, so there we go. That's signals, that's rail signals, the best I can explain them. We'll show them off in junctions. On straight rails, they're really pretty straightforward. And I know we didn't, again, we didn't do a, ho a whole lot of physical building. Our system's a little messed up. We should be fine though, we have plenty of coal here. Uh, and next episode, we will connect these all up. I will try off camera to get the um, grid system working on my other sections. Um, this one should be straightforward. I'm not quite sure how these are gonna work, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, and there we go. So hopefully you guys found that helpful. Hopefully it made sense. I know it was a very, very much amount of information. Um, again, we will go over this, each of these topics again, once we you know encounter them again. So hopefully it can refresh your memory and stuff. And uh, if you have any questions, do leave them below. Uh, and again, these blueprints are available on my website if you want to use these. Um, I think what I'll do though is I will if I will try to get these aligned with the global grid and then maybe I'll just try to put the the blueprint string in a in a paste bin or something and put that in the description um, once I have these set up properly. They still work perfectly fine without the global grid. Um, that's just a brand new feature that some people may want to utilize. But as always, thank you so much for watching. If you did find this helpful, a like is much appreciated so others can find this video and the series and hopefully find it helpful too. If you're new to the game, I hope you're having a fantastic time with it. I hope uh, you're enjoying this series and uh, help, it's helping you make your way through the game. If you're new to the channel, feel free to subscribe to keep up with all the new content that's coming out. And uh, I do plan to do some videos more on the tutorial campaign. I know I kind of just stopped that after one episode, some more standalone tutorials. Uh, I've been pretty crazy in real life right now though. So I'm trying my best. Those will come out, promise. Anyway, leave your thoughts below. And until next time, guys, I look forward to seeing you all and do take care.